Chapter 1 The Last Best Word I told a story in my book, The Jesus I Never Knew, a true story that long afterward continued to haunt me. I heard it from a friend who works with the down and out in Chicago. A prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told me she had been renting out her daughter, two years old, to men interested in kinky sex. She made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could earn on her own in a night. She had to do it, she said, to support her own drug habit. I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable. I'm required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman. At last I asked if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. What struck me about my friend's story is that women, much like this prostitute, fled toward Jesus, not away from him. The worse a person felt about herself, the more likely she saw Jesus as a refuge. Has the church lost that gift? Evidently, the down and out who flocked to Jesus when he lived on earth no longer feel welcome among his followers. What has happened? The more I pondered this question, the more I felt drawn to one word as the key. All that follows uncoils from that one word. As a writer, I play with words all day long. I toy with them, listen for their overtones, crack them open, and try to stuff my thoughts inside. I have found that words tend to spoil over the years like old meat. Their meaning rots away. Consider the word charity, for instance. When King James translators contemplated the highest form of love, they settled on the word charity to convey it. Nowadays, we hear the scornful protest, I don't want your charity. Perhaps I keep circling back to grace because it is one grand theological word that is not spoiled. I call it the last best word because every English usage I can find retains some of the glory of the original. Like a vast aquifer, the word underlies our proud civilization, reminding us that good things come not from our own efforts, rather by the grace of God. Even now, despite our secular drift, taproots still stretch toward grace. Listen to how we use the word. Many people say grace before meals, acknowledging daily bread as a gift from God. We are grateful for someone's kindness, gratified by good news, congratulated when successful, gracious in hosting friends. When a person's service pleases us, we leave a gratuity. In each of these uses, I hear a pang of childlike delight in the undeserved. A composer of music may add grace notes to the score. Though not essential to the melody, they are gratuitous, these notes add a flourish whose presence would be missed. When I first attempt a piano sonata by Beethoven or Schubert, I play it through a few times without the grace notes. The sonata carries along, but oh what a difference it makes when I am able to add the grace notes, which season the piece like savory spices. In England, some uses hint loudly at the word's theological source. British subject address royalty as your grace. Students at Oxford and Cambridge may receive a grace, exempting them from certain academic requirements. Parliament declares an act of grace to pardon a criminal. New York publishers also suggest a theological meaning with their policy of gracing. If I sign up for 12 issues of a magazine, I may receive a few extra copies even after my subscription has expired. These are grace issues, sent free of charge or gratis to tempt me to resubscribe. Credit cards, rental car agencies, and mortgage companies likewise extend to customers an undeserved grace period. I also learn about a word from its opposite. Newspapers speak of communism's fall from grace, a phrase similarly applied to Jimmy Swaggart, Richard Nixon, and O.J. Simpson. We insult a person by pointing out the dearth of grace. 
You ingrate, we say, or worse. You're a disgrace. A truly despicable person has no saving grace about him. My favorite use of the root word grace occurs in the mellifluous phrase persona non grata. A person who offends the U.S. government by some act of treachery is officially proclaimed a person without grace. The many uses of the word in English convince me that grace is indeed amazing, truly our last best word. It contains the essence of the gospel as a drop of water can contain the image of the sun. The world thirsts for grace in ways it does not even recognize. Little wonder the hymn Amazing Grace edged its way to the top ten charts 200 years after composition. For a society that seems adrift, without moorings, I know of no better place to drop an anchor of faith. Like grace notes in music, though, the state of grace proves fleeting. The Berlin Wall falls in a night of euphoria. South African blacks queue up in long, exuberant lines to cast their first votes ever. Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shake hands in the Rose Garden. For a moment, grace descends. And then Eastern Europe sullenly settles into the long task of rebuilding. South Africa tries to figure out how to run a country. Arafat dodges bullets, and Rabin is felled by one. Like a dying star, grace dissipates in a final burst of pale light and is then engulfed by the black hole of ungrace. The great Christian revolutions, said H. Richard Niebuhr, come not by the discovery of something that was not known before. They happen when somebody takes radically something that was always there. Oddly, I sometimes find a shortage of grace within the church, an institution founded to proclaim in Paul's phrase, the gospel of God's grace. Author Stephen Brown notes that a veterinarian can learn a lot about a dog owner he has never met just by observing the dog. What does the world learn about God by watching us, his followers, on earth? Trace the roots of grace or charis in Greek, and you will find a verb that means, I rejoice, I am glad. In my experience, rejoicing and gladness are not the first images that come to mind when people think of the church. They think of holier than thou's. They think of church as a place to go after you have cleaned up your act, not before. They think of morality, not grace. Church, said the prostitute, why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They'd just make me feel worse. Such an attitude comes partly from a misconception or bias by outsiders. I have visited soup kitchens, homeless shelters, hospices, and prison ministries staffed by Christian volunteers, generous with grace. And yet the prostitute's comment stings because she has found a weak spot in the church. Some of us seem so anxious about avoiding hell that we forget to celebrate our journey toward heaven. Others of us, rightly concerned about issues in a modern culture war, neglect the church's mission as a haven of grace in this world of ungrace. Grace is everywhere, said the dying priest in Georges Bernanoff's novel Diary of a Country Priest. Yes, but how easily we pass by, deaf to the euphony. I attended a Bible college. Years later, when I was sitting next to the president of that school on an airplane, he asked me to assess my education. Some good, some bad, I replied. I met many godly people there. In fact, I met God there. Who can place a value on that? And yet I later realized that in four years, I learned almost nothing about grace. It may be the most important word in the Bible, the heart of the gospel. How could I have missed it? I related our conversation in a subsequent chapel address, and in doing so, offended the faculty. Some suggested I not be invited back to speak. One gentle soul wrote to ask whether I should have phrased things differently. Shouldn't I have said that as a student I lacked the receptors to receive the grace that was all around me? Because I respect and love this man, I thought long and hard about his question. 
Ultimately, however, I concluded that I had experienced as much ungrace on the campus of a Bible college as I had anywhere else in life. A counselor, David Siemens, summed up his career this way. Many years ago, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems among evangelical Christians are these, the failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness, and the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. We read, we hear, We believe a good theology of grace, but that's not the way we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated the level of our emotions. The world can do almost anything as well as or better than the church, says Gordon MacDonald. You need not be a Christian to build houses, feed the hungry, or heal the sick. There is only one thing the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. MacDonald has put his finger on the church's single most important contribution. Where else can the world go to find grace? The Italian novelist Ignazio Salone wrote about a revolutionary hunted by the police. In order to hide him, his comrades dressed him in the garb of a priest and sent him to a remote village in the foothills of the Alps. Word got out, and soon a long line of peasants appeared at his door, full of stories of their sins and broken lives. The priest protested and tried to turn them away to no avail. He had no recourse but to sit and listen to the stories of people starving for grace. I sense, in fact, that is why any person goes to church, out of hunger for grace. The book, Growing Up Fundamentalist, tells of a reunion of students from a missionary academy in Japan. With one or two exceptions, all had left the faith and come back, one of the students reported, and those of us who had come back had one thing in common. We had all discovered grace. As I look back on my own pilgrimage, marked by wanderings, detours, and dead ends, I see now that what pulled me along was my search for grace. I rejected the church for a time because I found so little grace there. I returned because I found grace nowhere else. I have barely tasted of grace myself. I have rendered less than I have received and am in no wise an expert on grace. These are, in fact, the very reasons that impel me to write. I want to know more, to understand more, to experience more grace. I dare not and the danger is very real, write an ungracious book about grace. Except then, here at the beginning, that I write as a pilgrim qualified only by my craving for grace. Grace does not offer an easy subject for a writer. To borrow E.B. White's comment about humor, grace can be dissected as a frog, but the thing dies in the process and the innards are discouraging to any but the pure scientific mind. I have just read a 13-page treatise on grace in the New Catholic Encyclopedia, which has cured me of any desire to dissect grace and display its innards. I do not want the thing to die. For this reason, I will rely more on stories than on syllogisms. In sum, I would far rather convey grace then explain it.